December 17th, uh, regular board meeting. Um, also want to wish everybody a uh, happy holiday season and a Merry Christmas. Uh, that time is upon us, and before we know it, uh, we'll be here. Um, with that said, if you would uh, rise and remain standing for both our um, invocation and the pledge. And we've got Ms. Scheider uh, with the Praise Tabernacle of the Liberty Church of Ruffin, and we appreciate your coming and leading us for this invitation. Thank you, ma'am. Again, remain standing for our students who are going to lead us in the pledge afterwards. Good evening. Good evening. Let us pray. Precious Father, in the name of Jesus, please bless these assembled here this evening. Lord, we know that where there is unity, there is strength. Let the education of our children be that motivating force that propels us in making the right decisions. We pray for unified resolutions in this board meeting tonight and for decisions that are based on righteousness and pleasing in your sight. Bless those in authority, for your word says that when the righteous is in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked bear rule, the people moan. Let those with authority be blessed with wisdom to carry out your purpose. Please bless us with a peaceful meeting, Lord. These blessings we ask in Jesus' name. And Lord, we ask you to look upon our superintendent tonight. Lord, we ask you to give her a supernatural strength for the journey. Lord, we ask you to look at those that are in the board meeting, Lord. Give them strength. All the board members, all those that are in authority, all the educators, Lord, give them strength for this journey, Lord. And our motto would be like Northside Elementary School, reaching higher, shining brighter. We've got to reach higher and shine brighter. We're going to make it. We're going to reach no further than excellence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for the challenge of the, of the words of inspiration. And uh, now we've got Jennings Chapman, Ben Kennedy, and Aaron Rhodes, students from Northside, to come lead us in the pledge. Again, we appreciate you students and your parents uh, uh, being here uh, to lead us at this time. Thank you. Now, I may have missed a student because I've got three names and I see four. So who did I miss? Elizabeth Price. We had her with us. Show introduce yourselves to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Ben Kennedy. session to discuss a personnel matter. I'll promise to be brief and hopefully we will be out shortly. Executive session. So I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, a motion that we go into executive session for personnel matter. Got a motion? Okay. We have a second. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Any opposed it's unanimous, Chris. And y'all be patient. With us, we'll be quick. Thank you. Thank you. Right, uh, I'll entertain a motion to come out of executive session. Motion and second. Uh, any discussion? Um, we're coming out of the executive session where we discussed a personnel matter. Any further discussion? Chairman, I'd like to make a motion. Well, let me get a vote on this first. Uh, all those in favor of uh, the motion, signify by raising your hand. Thank you. Mr. Hayes? Chairman, I make a motion. I move to authorize the chairman of the board to sign the letter presented to the board regarding the personnel matter. We have a motion to authorize the chairman of the board of trustees to uh, sign a letter to address a personnel matter. Say so. We've got a second. Any discussion? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bowman? Um, 
couple things. Um, I'm not going to be voting for this motion. And usually when I vote no on a motion, I try to um, allow my constituents to understand why I don't. Um, in this letter that we're proposing, the reason why I'm going to vote no is because I don't think this letter is far-reaching enough. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't, in my opinion, address the issue um, that is presented. Um, I, I, I really believe that our constituents, the voters of this county, um, deserve more than, than the level at which this letter addressed. And even if, if it doesn't, in my opinion, there is a, a median. There, there's a happy median that we as a board should be able to reach in order to please our constituents. So for, for that purpose and, and for, with that understanding is the reason why I will not be voting for the acceptance of this document. All right, Mr. Bowman, I appreciate your thoughts. Any other discussion? All right, uh, we have a motion on the floor. Um, all those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Uh, those opposed? Chris, you got it? 6 4 1 against. Thank you, board. I appreciate that. Um, this time I'll also entertain a motion to uh, approve our minutes from a regular board meeting of November 19th. Uh, and our minutes for the committee of the whole meeting of November 12th, of course, this year, 2013. So Chair, I make a motion. I'm sorry, Mr. Barbara. Said so got a motion? Mr. Right. Hayes, got a second? second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor, please signify by raising your hand. Chris, it's unanimous, I believe. Any opposed? No? All right, uh, public input. Thank you, fellow board members. We've got Kermit. Hudson. Be kind of tough to film yourself, now, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> good at it. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> um, I think I've been here about a year now, um, videotaping the board meetings, and I've sat through. Um, thank you, Tony. I've sat through a lot of um, a lot of discussion, a lot of um, a lot of votes, a lot of. A lot of topics. And I look back recently and I know that there's been situations of State Department investigation, there's been situations of PCAR, there's been situations of all types of topics. Um, one thing I wanted to look back upon is um, when was the last time one of these meetings involved anything regarding students? Um, their education, in, in, to be specific. Now, I know that there are internal matters um, that make this district run. I know those can't be avoided. I know you have to go through them. But there's a point to where the students are being, not to say left out, but I just think that the past couple meetings that I've sat through have been negative. They've been about what's wrong in the district. They've been about what needs to be fixed. And I think it's time to throw something in there to make it look positive. Because someone out in Orangeburg is going to look at, not just Orangeburg in particular, but other districts, will look in and say, well, you know, Collin County's got their own troubles within them right now. We don't really need to deal with them. Don't need to send them any money. Don't need to send them... Um, any students, just let them fend for themselves until they can figure out what's wrong with their own district. And, um, you know, a, I heard a student say a remark um, the other day that um, when the discussion came up about a P-card, they didn't know what a P-card was. They really didn't care what it was. And I had one tell me, you know, we don't know what's going on up there. We don't we don't come to the board meetings, and I was like, well, if you sat behind the camera and watched one, and watched the past that I've watched, you would 
you'd be surprised to see what changes have been made for the good, and I think it's time that we reflect on those. Um, because if we continue to put in the negative, um, then what will the students start to think if they start to look upon that as, okay, this is how we need to act when we grow up. Children must be taught how to think, not what to think. Thank you. Thank you, Kermit. Uh, Ms. Teresa Price. Ms. Price, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, unfortunately, I'm not here to talk about the positive. Um, over the last month, uh, it's been brought to my attention from several young students and older students, the middle school, high school age students, that there is a very serious bullying issue. I know our district has always um, been proud of their no bullying policy, but it's not being effective. It's not working for these students. I was contacted before the holiday break um, from a middle school student that was concerned because he had overheard some other young ladies in his group of kids on the, his time out discussing that they were going to jump another female student. So I called his parent, we spoke, we monitored the internet, Facebook, Instagram. I, what we read was not only concerning, it was disturbing and scary. Um, I immediately placed a call to the school where these students attend. The principal was unavailable, so I sent an email with all of the information that both myself and the other parent had gathered. I got a response, um, thank you for the information. Can you see, please send me screenshots? I did. Uh, over 20 screenshots of conversations with horrible language, horrible attitude. The young lady trying to defend herself, being bashed. Um, and it was clear that they were planning to have a fight with her. Um, I sent the information, I didn't get anything back, but during the time period, of the holiday, my family got the flu, we were very ill. I got a call from the other mother saying on Instagram, look, look, they're beating her up. There's a video that has been taken down, but at that time was there. I emailed back, said, look, this link is up. You need to check it out. You need to, I mean, I can send you all my email. It showed the child being beaten up. It heard the laughter in the background of the other students that were involved. It also showed another video of them burning her clothing, her jacket, her underclothes, her bra. It had pictures of the conversation where the young lady, one student said, yeah, I was there. It's so funny. It was disgusting. I um, got upset because this could have been prevented. The information was given before this child was attacked. I don't have any personal involvement with the child. I don't know her, but she could have been my child or your child. During this time, a friend of mine called me and told me her son at the high school was being bullied. He's a student at TCTC in the high school. The bullying started at TCTC and they are trying their best to help her. But the incident goes over through the bus system from the high school to the TCTC. The students being harassed at the high school. He was assaulted on no less than two occasions. Nothing has been done. They had a conference last week. Parents, district office, principal, Tagalo counselor. Every step that we can take has been exhausted. Now it's to you all. It's not being helped. He's not being helped. This child is in fear of his safety and refusing to go back to school. His parent is asked to let him be in the K-12 program. My only problem with that is that he is losing his chance. He is missing out on his chance in a normal high school career because the system is not protecting him, and I don't find that acceptable. I find it heartbreaking disturbing and sad, but I don't find it acceptable. <sighs> Sorry. 
<clears throat> These bullies should be the ones that are not allowed in our schools. Their parents and them should have accountability for their own actions. It should be their parents that are missing work to straighten their student out and their terroristic behavior, their attitude, their bullying should not be allowed in our school while these young men are sitting at home because he's too scared to go to our school. <coughs> Where is his justice? Where is his prom? How is he supposed to join in with his normal everyday sporting events? Everything that we enjoyed as a child, he's going to lose because we're not doing our job as parents, as in district employees, as these children's mentors. I'm sorry, but if we have an opportunity to stop a situation, we need to do that. If we can protect one child, we need to do that. And these children that are being bullies, these children that are hurting our children or your children, whoever's children, they're ours. I don't care who birthed them, they're ours. These children that are hurting our children need to be stopped and held accountable for their actions. They need to be punished. A no tolerance policy, in my opinion, is the first time should be the last time. There was a incident last year where a young lady took a video on a school bus. A parent got upset because her daughter was not viewed well in it. That young lady got one day ISS. This young man has physically been assaulted and no one has gotten any punishment. The child was pulled into the office and said, hey, so-and-so said you're bullying them. What happened to, if you don't want them to know it was you telling on them so that you feel safe? What happened to privacy for him? Why did the bully get told, hey, he's the one telling on you? It's ridiculous, and I'm sorry, I don't find it right. Our system, we brag every day, well, we're no tolerance. I don't see the punishment, so I don't think it's true. We also <laughs> brag that we have the highest dropout, the lowest dropout rate every board meeting I have been to. That's one of the subjects. We have the best, we're not, we don't have as many dropout rates. Our dropout rate is this. I hear Dr. Dixon preaching to it. Even at a dinner we had, I heard him talking about it. But my problem is, it's not that we don't have as many students dropping out. If at all, we have more. They're just homeschooling. They're transferring out of our district. They're finding other places that they're safer, they feel comfortable. Places other than us. And instead of adding them to a tally to say, hey, they didn't drop out, they just moved. Find out why they left our district. Find out what we did to push them out and fix it. That's all I have to say. Thank, thank you, Ms. Price. Jim, I haven't seen this Thank you. I want to give Ms. Williams a chance, if she could, to possibly address some of these concerns. If, if you can, Ms. Williams, or um, will, please. I received the email, I think, on the weekend. Um, I've contacted both principals and um, got a very thorough detail, especially from the middle school. I know the, middle, the high school uh, was out of the district on today, um, so I have not had a, a thorough opportunity to <coughs> sit down with the principal, but did get a response from um, the director at TCTC. But that's the first time it was sorry. brought to my yes. attention. Um, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Chairman. Um, we as a board, we usually try not to, unless it's something extremely imperative, um, conversate or respond during public input. That's an opportunity for the public to come before us with issues. Um, every last one of our board members that's sitting up here, we have a zero tolerance for bullying. I want to make sure that the public understands that. Um, I hear Ms. Price in her, in her statement just now you made reference to um, punishment, and you even one time said that if you don't see the punishment, then how do you know what happens? Well, the law prevents you from seeing the punishment, simply because of our responsibility to protect students' rights or student privacies. Okay, um, so I don't, if it happens, if it happens, I'm, I'm thoroughly shocked that it happens. And what I'm talking, when I say it, what am I talking about? An incident that occurs between two students and just punishment does not happen. If 
if it needs to happen. Um, so just because your child gets in an altercation with another child and you don't see or you don't have knowledge of what happens to the child B does not mean that nothing happens. Um, I heard you also said that you gave this information to the appropriate people. That's about the, that's about all you can do as a as a parent or as a citizen. Um, and again, hopefully, we have professional staff members in this district that would take care of incidences that occur within our schools. Um, but I certainly don't want the public to think that we as a board have knowledge of them and also have knowledge of the fact that nothing is occurring as a result of these incidences. I can promise you that that does not happen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other comments? And one thing I will echo, Ms. Price, and to the members of the public that are here, um, I, you know, from this board's perspective, there's zero tolerance for bullying. Um, and I, I do believe Ms. Williams and her staff, no doubt in my mind, feel that way. Um, <coughs> if we have missed an opportunity to address an issue, then we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that happens. But I, I want to think that, um, you know, issues of this nature that were described, hopefully the law has been called in by the parents because it sounds like something, you know, uh, based on what was said, would require action of the law enforcement. And hopefully that's happened, and that's not something the school necessarily has to be the one to drive it, but to the extent that we see it, we have to address it, obviously. I'm guessing that incident didn't happen on the school grounds. It happened outside in the public domain. Um, with respect to, uh, you know, uh, behavior of students that could become disruptive to the classroom setting, I mean, policy is pretty clear on that. Uh, that is something this district can deal with, and we have dealt with it in the past when it has been outside of the classroom. So um, do appreciate the concern. Uh, we definitely need the public to be, you know, sensitive to um, issues of this nature, um, and we'll continue to look for the district, district to took the banner of a, we're not going to tolerate bullies. But with that said, I'm going to move on to uh, superintendent's report, Ms. Williams. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, this month, we're going to have a presentation on um, Title I and our federal programs. Um, so for, from Title I, we have Ms. Kathy Turner and her staff, um, Ms. Shelby Simmons, and um, Ms. Tiffany. Um, and I think we have Mr. Simmons also supporting them. And then Mr. Pence will also share some information. As you know, Ms. Sue Chaplin is our um, works with the grants that deal with our federal projects, but unfortunately, she has the flu and not able to be with us this time. Good evening. Good evening. We appreciate the opportunity to brag about Title I. We do a lot in our office, and, and it's just primarily the three of us that do this. Good. Come on. Um, we support the district's mission statement. Um, this is our mission. We um, do support the district's mission in its efforts to make students college and career ready. Um, we keep going. Who we are. There are just three of us right now. I'm the squinty one in the middle. Um, but total years of experience, there's 44 years of educational experience just among the three of us and 18 years of business. So we feel that we've brought a lot to the Title I office as far as our capacity. Here's what we do. We support and we supplement the district's effort to educate students. We support technically through planning, and we take part in all plans that schools in the district have, from the strategic plan to the school renewal plan. We are a piece of the puzzle, pieces of the part. We also monitor our schools. This year, we will be formally evaluated or monitored by the State Department of Education in April, <coughs> along with Title VI. So in an effort to make sure that we're completely ready for this monitoring, we are also conducting monitoring visits at the school to make sure that all schools are ready for these visits. And then we document our implementation for efforts and our programs, as well as our compliance with Title I law. And as you see listed here, these are the areas of the law that we cover. Everything from migrant education to homeless education as part of Title I. We also support school staff. 
So we provide staff development at all of the schools in the McKinney Dental Law, which is homeless education, the migrant education legislation. We also support um, compliance, and I've also provided staff development at the high school and other schools in educational technology and parental involvement and parental engagement. Okay, Title I also supports the schools with the budget. Um, we have a little more than $2.8 million that we contribute <coughs> to the district's effort. And primarily, as you see here, are those areas that we have supported the district. And you'll see in a minute how that breaks out. But primarily, it's class size reduction, and we've done that for as long as I've been in Title I. That's been a primary service of the Title I department. We also support students. So in the past several years, we have um, supported the superintendent's literacy initiative by moving from prizes and gifts as incentives to books as incentives at all of the parents and events. We support parents' abilities to help their students. So the sessions that I teach or that are available at all of the schools directly teach positive parenting. They support the PBIS system that we have in the schools. We have a technology checkout program that provides study buddies, which are handheld self-paced tutoring devices um, and laptops to parents to help their children. And then we also directly impact teacher quality by the extensive staff development that's done at the school level um, to support the teachers there. Next. One important feature of the Title I office is that everything we do is through collaboration, working with others. So one of our lead partners are the schools and the school administrators. Um, Ms. Turner has served on various leadership teams. We serve in different groups. Um, we do, as we mentioned before, staff development. And we work with the parents at the individual schools to make sure that they're aware of what's going on in the schools, the opportunities for volunteering and supporting the schools. Um, and we are also work within the community, which you'll hear about this slide. Here. Here are some of the agencies and uh, groups that we work with. As you can see, we work with the Migrant Task Force, which is a local group. We also collaborate at the state level um, for migrant education. We've worked very closely with the public library, the sheriff's office, who support, um, along with SROs, who support the Back to School Bash, where we provided supplies for over 600 students in August, and that's an annual event. We work closely with Eat Smart Move More Colleton, who's providing programming not only at the schools to support health and wellness, but they're also working with our partnership with Palmetto Rural Telephone Co-op to provide television programs on local access cable to support that effort for health and wellness in homes as well as in schools. Uh, I myself serve on the South Carolina Department of Education's Committee of Practitioners, and that's the quickest way for us to get information that federal law impacts school districts. And I've worked on that committee for the last three years. Uh, we also conduct or have been involved in biannual trainings. The South Carolina Department, uh, the Title I office, will conduct two trainings a year, one in the fall and one in the spring. And we're kept apprised of what is changing or what is happening with the law. Uh, Shelby has done the most recent State Department um, presentations, not only for Title I, but also for Ed Technology. We participated very heavily with the advanced ed accreditation process that we went through last year, and we're constantly involved with grant writing that the district has done. We also have a lot of results um, that we brought to the table here. We do a lot of surveys. Last year, we conducted surveys with parents and had over 2,000 responses in one week. And that is a, a pretty good response rate. But what you see here listed um, are those uh, items on our survey that demonstrated the greatest desire or needs by our stakeholders. And as a result, we have interventionists and uh, additional teachers due to Title I funding. One of the things that I think we can confidently <coughs> say is that Title I, we listen. We have parents who come by or call all the time to give us information about things they're concerned about, things that they appreciate. And this survey is one of our primary documents um, that show the parents' input. Um, for parents, as I mentioned, we provide parent sessions. But we also have parent centers at all of the schools. 
that provide either um, pamphlets, brochures, videos, even fitness kits that parents can use at home with their children. We also do the parent calendar and handbook um, that we update every year so that parents are able to have at home not just the events going on at their school for the year, like the PTO, SIC, and other events, but if they have children at multiple schools, they'll have the information for primary school, the elementary school, the middle school, and the high school, so that parents can make informed decisions, not only for volunteering, but also for attending events, which is very important. And not only are we governed by the ESEA, the education, uh, elementary and secondary education law, or the federal law, but we also collaborate regarding the school report card and data that is derived for that report. Um, and we use a lot of the same survey questions so that we inform one another, uh, making sure that our information remains valid from one to the other. So the... Um this is discussing a little bit more detail about our literacy initiative, and you can see our bookcase at the Title I office and some of the books that were provided to schools for um, distribution at parent events. Um, there is an updated chart on your handout with the number of book dis uh, books distributed because it's an ongoing process. We're constantly receiving either books at a discounted rate or um, donations of free books that we provide to parents and students. Um, this year we've had over 10,000 books awarded to our program and they'll go out to schools, as I said, for distribution. And our total program is well over 14,000 books over the past two and a half years. And this is very, very, very popular with parents. Um, when they come into our office anymore, the first place that they go to is our bookcase and we give them a book. We want to make sure that when they come in that we're providing not only the service, but we can provide them something additional so they can help their child at home. I know it was also a very popular feature for the open houses at the schools and the STEM night at the middle school. Um, we gave away over 400 books. So it's been very popular and it's a lot of fun. And it's great to have parents and students come back and tell us about the book and what the next in the series or something similar. Um, we mentioned about the survey. Um, last year we had over 2,009 responses, well, 2,009 responses to the parent survey. However, since I have um, been in this position, which this will be my third year, we've actually had over 6,000 responses to surveys that we've given. Um, we've had over 20,000 website views. So given the population of the school, it's, it's quite significant. There's details in the handout um, about the websites that our office maintains, trying to get as much information as possible out to the public. Um, having information in printed and electronic format is one of the recommendations from the state and federal government, so we ensure that that happens. And then we also visit schools directly, and you'll also note that we've held over 100 sessions at schools and the district level since 2010. And Shelby has done a tremendous job in increasing our capacity to reach uh, through all venues, our constituents, our parents. All right, this will tell you how we, and you have this information also in your handout. Who receives Title I funds? Well, first of all, it's based on <coughs> levels of poverty. In our district, uh, we rank our schools in a rank order based on the percentage of students receiving free or reduced lunch. Federal law says that in order for Title I to support a school, it must receive at least 35% free or reduced lunch. Uh, and we must support schools that have a 75% or greater free and reduced lunch population. Then, once those schools are determined, we then base our decisions on a needs assessment. These needs assessments cover everything from standardized test scores to some of the surveys that we do not only for the ESEA, but for the state report card. We use that information. And we meet frequently, not only just with the schools, but we also meet with our uh, committee of practitioners here at the district level. Here are how funds are allocated. First level is the United States Department of Education determines what the state allocation would be based on the most recent census data. And they base that based on our census they then determine what an allocation to the state and ultimately even a base allocation to the district based on our population. Uh, once they do that base allocation to the district, then the state comes in with their formula 
and they add to that base, and that's how we get our allocation each year. Here's how we process it from that allocation. We rank order our schools based on their percentage of free and reduced lunch status. Then the schools are allocated funding through a per pupil amount, and that's important. It isn't just an amount, it's by student. Then that per pupil amount applies only to students who receive that free and reduced lunch. And we multiply that number by the per pupil allocation. And then federal law requires that schools with the highest percentage of free and reduced lunch they are allocated a per pupil amount at least as much as the school below them, if not better than the school that has a lower percentage of free and reduced lunch. And so this is how it breaks down this year for our allocation. And this is the final allocations for our schools. Hendersonville has the highest percentage of free and reduced lunch. You see that in the second column there. You see the number of students that they have that meet that criteria of free and reduced lunch. We use the per pupil allocation, and then we determine what that final allocation is once we multiply those together. Now, Title I supports class size reduction very heavily. We support 42.42 FTEs in our district. And this is how, it's 85.4% of our entire allocation. Well, we kind of match what the districts is. The district basically has up to above an 80% where we cover salaries. So Title I is in line with the district there, and you can see how that plays out. The other activities you see listed here pretty much cover the entire project. From parent involvement, we are required to cover the, uh, to award 1% of the allocation to parent involvement. We actually have a little bit more because we value um, our parents and are putting more effort into that. We have professional development. This is done through the schools. Uh, we have plans for a summer pre-kindergarten, kindergarten program for next summer. Uh, some supplies, a little bit of technology, and the total allocation with the carryover, as you see the bottom line. Here's how the FTEs break down. I uh, thought we might get a question on this. We have 26.92 teachers, and that's allowable based on, Mr. Pence and I worked very closely at the very beginning of the year to determine what the class size ratios are and we cover and have been able to cover as many teachers as we possibly can to support the district's effort, particularly in the last few years where economic circumstances have encouraged us to do so. We have seven and a half certified interventionists. These are teachers, mostly retired, who come back and work with students in small groups. We also have paraprofessional interventionists. These individuals push into a classroom and work with students <coughs> with the teacher. So they are constantly supervised by a highly qualified teacher. Uh, we have one middle school coach, instructional coach. We have two people at our level, at the, at the administrative level, at the district level, that administrate the Title I program. And we have two positions for LEA administrative per, uh, paraprofessionals. Next steps. Yep. Okay, so this is a list of some of the um, meetings that we already have scheduled for upcoming um, for the remainder of the school year. And we've had about as many meetings in the first semester. Um, so we, we spend a lot of time meeting with stakeholders um, at the schools and with the community. One of the most popular events is the annual district forum. Um, last year it was held at Forest Circle. Um, it's a wonderful event where we get to invite a lot of uh, the community members and parents and ask them and present to them um, what we're doing, what we think is important. We get um, survey responses from them and comments from them and get a chance to meet them on a, a little bit more social, less formal um, level and really find out what's important to them and that helps inform the upcoming uh, plans. Um, while we directly address the top survey responses, and you'll note on the handout, there's a list of all of the responses, the number of people and percentage, so all of this data is there. Um, there are some things that may not have ranked quite as highly, and it helps us evaluate our existing programs. So for example, um, we found that we got a lot of uh, survey responses based on some of the incentives for completing surveys. So we took a, a careful look at that. 
Um, and what we did was we provided pizza parties for kids that were supported with parents coming in, doing um, a, a, a session with parents during the party, and providing additional literacy um, materials, so books. Um, we looked at parents who said 71% said that they wanted full day kindergarten. Um, they were also in favor of literacy programs. So we kind of combined those ideas for the summer ready to read program. Um, we also spoke with teachers who were doing, um, working with kindergarten and first grade students and noticed that as a need. Um, and then we also were looking at the use of technology in schools, and we know that was an uh, issue mentioned by Advance Ed. It's something that um, parents were also concerned about, and we know that the board has addressed. And Title I is doing our part to assist with that as well. Next slide. Finally, um, we have some statements that reflect the state report card surveys. Um, we work with our calendar. We work with uh, the communication that we have on our website and in other formats with parents. And we ask them basically how we're doing in the survey. And we modify what we do to reflect their comments. Yes. So in F and to end the presentation, we feel that we are meeting our mission as we continue to, to push forward. And we will continue to work with our stakeholders to make sure that we provide students the best opportunities through the partnerships that we build with our community and our constituents. We also will continue to monitor our state and federal compliance and making sure that our district meets the standards as required by the state and federal government. And then we also continue to measure the impact of Title I initiatives to make sure that we're providing exactly what our district, district does need. And that concludes our report. We, the last slide on this just is giving you our contact information. It's also on your handout should you have any questions. Questions from the board from Ms. Uh, Turner and her staff. Again, thank you all for your presentation. Anybody? Yeah, I have one question. Mr. Um, the survey, what do you all do with this information once you get it? You know, what do you do with it in order to well, we better, count. Better the district now. Well, we count and we provide that information. We publish that information. If you check out the Title I web, uh, website, you'll find that our survey responses are listed there. Mm -hmm. We do provide that information. We also report to the schools and report to parents. Every year, at the very beginning of the year, we conduct what we call an annual meeting. And it used to be back when I first started, we did it at one Title I school for the district. We felt that a better way to do it would be to meet all the constituents, so we conduct an annual meeting at the beginning of the year at every Title I school. And we provide the parents at that time information about our surveys. We also include it in the plan. So there has to be information in our Title I plan that informs the decisions that we make, and we cite those survey responses. Yes. Um, I just also wanted to say that when we collect the survey information, um, we have to protect the identity of the, the parents that respond. So anytime that we post any information, it's an aggregate, um, but they identify which school they're associated with. And so to each of the schools, the school administrators, they receive their school's results as well as the district's result, results to inform their school plans as well. Now, the, the, the last question on this survey, or at least how you have it listed here, talks about, um, the parents having access to laptops, study buddies, or internet access to districts. Um, tell me, I, I, how, do, how do parents get access to our, or how do we give access to, to the internet to parents? How, how do they take advantage of this? How, we are in the Title I Parent Center, which is the Floyd Buckner Title I Parent Center. It's located by the old, <laughs> behind the old technology center. Mm -hmm. And we have internet access in our office, and we've had parents who have come in to take courses at local colleges or online school, and they'll come in and they'll use our equipment while we're there to be online. We also check out laptops that can be easily, because they're wireless, can easily you know, tie into the internet if they have that access at home. So they sign this equipment out at home. The purpose of the equipment is so that they can help their children on this equipment. 
and of course I can't follow them home, and sometimes that equipment gets used on the internet. Right. Um, However, it is, um, we do have the uh, protective software on it that's all monitored by the technology department. That's because correct. I see the results of 51% of parents. I guess you can interpret this as knowing that this was available. That's correct. And that's one of the reasons why we do promote it more, not only on our website, but it's actually in the parent calendars, which we printed almost 5,000 calendars and provided them at all of the Title I schools to make sure that parents were aware that this access is available. Good deal. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Um, I didn't skip out on y'all at the back of the room. I uh, listened the whole it. time. I appreciate the presentation. Uh, you know, you come to Cottage Elementary and four PTO meetings at the beginning of the year, explain all this to the parents. Um, the word is getting out. I appreciate uh, what you and your staff are doing. Thank you. Yeah, the, uh, the incentives that stimulate learning, not only with the students, obviously, but the parents, that's good stuff. Oh, big time. Yeah. Uh, uh, we've, uh, we've given out Kindle Fires software and uniforms as incentives for parents, and they we got 2009 surveys in a week, so I think that's a pretty big incentive. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Ms. Williams. Mr. Pence is going to uh, do a uh, brief piece of yeah, I'm kind of following up. <clears throat> Part of the Title I projects, whenever Ms. Turner submits a project, it says, how are you going to measure the effectiveness of this project? So back a number of years now, we've been giving map testing. So in our primary grades, pre-K through 2, We've introduced a new test this year. It's brand new. We've had it about a month. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about that. And part of this testing is, and Ms. Turner's last slide, or next to the last slide, says measure the impact. So that's what we're doing with uh, all this testing. And of course, our students say, all right, well, I've seen you have taken, done well in school. But how have you done in real life? And the kid says, I can take tests. So that's a little bit the way I think some of our teachers feel about testing. Uh, that our students are always being tested. All right, this new test is called Children's Progress. We call it the Children's Progress of Academic, I mean, of Adaptive Assessment, or CPAA. And we generally call it Children's Progress for short. All right, CPA. CPAA is a criterion reference test. All right, so I'm going to get ready to explain the difference between this test and the MAP test. Being a criterion reference test is, is testing students against specific standards or skills. And those skills in this test that it's testing against are common core state standards. So then it uses it's t testing this ch child is how well is this child achieving this standard? Where the MAP test is a nationally normed test. It's comparing this test, this student in Walterboro, South Carolina, against the entire nation. So if this child makes a uh, 157 on the MAP test, then they're looking, how do all these children, what are all the other children in the third grade making? So there's the difference. Um, we had, uh, all right, why did we want to change to CPAA rather than the primary map? Because we gave the primary map to our four-year-olds last year and our five-year-olds. And we got some uh, feedback from the teachers, hey, this is not age appropriate. They're just clicking everything. So um, we, we looked and felt like the, the CPAA is more student-friendly. It looks like a game, it's very colorful. The teachers who participate and the pilots think that it's age appropriate. It takes more than 20 to 30 minutes to complete where teachers this year were talking about the math because it's the new Common Core math taking much longer time. Uh, it can be given up to nine times a year. Back test can only be given three times. So as far as a formative assessment where that teacher is trying to grow that child, this is much more uh, friendly and manipulative by the teachers. The results, as you'll see as we go through the program, the students are automatically grouped and instructional activities are provided. 
So it's not it's not just a, an assessment. All right, parent reports describing how the child did or can be sent home, and the teacher knows what the uh, common core activities are. And one of the things that I didn't say is, is as soon as this child finishes this test, the results are available to the teacher. Where with the map, it's at least 24 hours before the teacher can get the, uh, the official results from NWA. But basically, the thing to remember is, this is not just an assessment. It's also an instructional tool. So I think that's important. By adaptive, and the map is set up the same way, the students start someplace kind of in the middle. And if they get it correct, they keep going up. So it adapts to how the student responds. So if the student misses, of course, they're going to go down. So, so the test is adjusting to however the student responds to the test. So it's giving uh, the teacher a rating of where this student is rather than just passing or failing. All right, this test has three windows or seasons. It has the fall, winter, and spring. Notice that the, the first season, the fall season, we really just finished giving this test. Uh, it goes up to 60, times <coughs> scores of 60. But to, uh, the red is below average. It gives results like below expectations, approaching expectations, at expectations, and above expectations. And then it has a corresponding um, color graph with bar graph. So there are three seasons, and notice that each season the expectation goes up. And so if the student here, let's say a student made 21 in the fall, that student to maintain is expected to make 41 in the winter. So this is giving that teacher feedback, is my child, is my student progressing at an expected level? And that's, that feedback is pretty immediate. And the plus, as we'll see a bit later, it's telling that teacher some specific information as to how to help that child. <clears throat> CPA gives four types of tests. It gives the school district level, it gives the school level, classroom level, and the individual student level. All right. This is an example of a report that the teachers get. And it's based on the, the fall kindergarten test. And this gives a, a report card. And then this is the school district. Notice it has these concepts of listening, phonemic writing, uh, phonemic awareness, and reading. So it gives a literacy test and a math test, which are all the same test. When they sit down and take this 20 to 30 minute test, they're being tested in both areas, uh, literacy and math. It also gives the district average over here on the far right. It gives a district average. And then that average corresponds to the score up in the bar. And then the graph shows right here. So for this, for this district on this particular testing in the fall, our students are scoring uh, by the greens. They're scoring at an expected level. And this is, looks like it's 36.8. And you come up here to 36.8, it's pretty much in the middle of this green area. All right, and then down here, it breaks it down to the actual number of students in each category. So if we clicked on, a teacher can click on this particular concept here, it's going to tell how the students in her class are doing on this uh, particular test. All right, let's go to the next. All right, now here again, point out that there is a 60, 0 to 60 in this fall phase of testing, all right? Then we go to the district role. Notice the big concept here is that at the district level, we can look and see how each school did. And then we can break it down. We can drill down from these sections here. But the main point here is, is that from the district level, we can tell how the schools are doing. All right, then it also shows progress from testing. So in this progress, is showing the fall testing compared to the spring testing or, or winter testing and so forth. So notice that this first one here has a span. So this, they had 
three students in the district take the Spanish version of the test, and they performed at an approaching expectation level. Then our, uh, in the fall, we had, have here, we had 487 students in uh, this grade level take the test. And that 487 had a 26.9, and so that's on the lower level of the at expectations level. Then we've had 76 students take the winter version, but those 76 students have shown a 45.5 increase, and that's an average, so we don't know what the average will be whenever all the students take it. But, just for uh, example purposes, that's almost 20 points increase right there from, basically that's going to be a month separating the testing. So this is the kindergarten and this is the school's version. So I use Black Street. So this is their school report. And that principal can go on and look at the, this is the winter score. And once she scores it, she gives her all of the all of her teachers. And then gives her how her students perform on the fall testing. Notice that uh, we we the number of students is, of course, is not as great because of the winter testing. Um, we just started that. And winter testing is pretty much the teachers on, on their own. Where the fall testing, we brought everybody in and we started the window. And when we finish the year, we're going to bring everybody in and have a closing. In. So then we can measure growth uh, from school to school, from teacher to teacher, and student to student. Okay. All right, then the teacher, the principal, once she puts the school role, just like the district gives all the schools, this is going to give all the, the, te the, the teacher's students who took the test. This is a list of the teachers whose students took the test. So then, it, then over here we take the concept of reading. And then it has grouped these teachers' classes. And so we have two classes who are down here below expectation, and we have two classes that are at expectation, and the rest of the classes are approaching expectation. So the principal and I have a way of monitoring the growth of these students. Um, and then, of course, the progress again, we're looking at the, from season to season, and it will give the increase in progress, and will give whether or not the, the students in this particular report gives whether or not the student has progressed from the fall to the winter or so forth. Notice this particular uh, student or class went down. So that when that teacher reads that, hopefully she's going to say, uh, they were here in the fall and they're here now. They went backwards. I need to find out what I need to do to bring my students back up to expectations and, and get them to the 20-point increase that I'm looking for. All right, and this, the students are then listed. The teacher can go into the report in the class role, and then all her students are listed. And in this skill, again, I've selected reading. She has one student that is at the below expectation and four students that are above expectation. So this teacher then is getting information as to how she might group her students during their individual activity times. So this is helping the teacher in the grouping of students in particular skills. Now each, each concept, listening, reading, phonics and writing, and phonics awareness is going to have a grouping. So that teacher can change that group up as she needs to. And you know, these, the, the, the primary students have children moving in groups during their activity time. And this can be part of the instruction for activity time. All right, now here's the benefit. We've got all I've showed you so far of an assessment. Now we're looking at what information does the teacher get after the success? It doesn't, it says it gives you more than this child is uh, below expectation. It actually groups the students we just saw in the previous slide where the students are grouped and then it has 
a group of where group students where an activity would be challenging, and one is one instructional, and another is supportive, and like listening comprehension skills. So each of these skills that gives a breakdown in the type of activities. In this particular activity, it tells the teacher, here's a suggested activity for these three students. All right. All right. Then it gives the teacher an opportunity for the progress report that says, all right, these students were here. The student was here in the first testing in the fall. They're here in the second testing for winter. So we look at math. Math is going down. So that teacher now has the opportunity because she can test nine times. She can teach to the weaknesses identified by this test and then have the child retest whenever she thinks she's ready. So the new evaluation system that we're exploring is based, uh, evaluates teachers based on student growth. So this is a tool particularly for our primary teachers. It gives them that information about where are they. Then it says here's some activities that will help them and then you can reassess, reassess the child later on. So in this, the math was going down, but the literacy took a nice move up. But the math went from above expectation to approaching expectation, where the literacy went from uh, at expectation and went up the second season still at, at, at expectation. At expectation, that's right. <laughs> All right. All right, now the teacher can get a, a report. And what's blacked out or darkened out is the child's name. And this is a full report that if you can read it, it tells exactly what that child did on this test. He picked, uh, in this case, it says, picked out her last name from a few distractors. So it tells how that child did. Plus, if you look over to the right, it gives it gives it whether or not the child got the correct answer on the first attempt, and that's the green arrow, and whether or not they got it on uh, needed a hint, or whether or not they missed it all together. The other thing that it does, not only it tells, here's what's tested, here's what this child does, but it gives an end of the year objective. So it's by the end of the year, and this end of the year objective is the Common Core State Standard. So it's telling the teacher exactly what that child needs to be able to do at the end of the year. Now with math teachers, they get a score. They have to do, they have a book that's really this thick called Descartes. And the Descartes has all the skills, but it's a massive thing to manipulate where this is very specific teacher friendly, student friendly, and it gives, once it gives that end of the year objective, it gives them an activity, a recommended activity to do in the classroom. So this is, uh, we've got great expectations on what we're going to be able to accomplish with this assessment. All right, next one. All right, and then there's a parent letter that goes home providing the activity. It tells the parent each, each concept and how the child did, it also gives the parents some suggestions on what they can do at home. So it's not leaving the parent out of the loop. Now, this, is, this assessment is so new, schools, we're still talking with schools about all right, now how are we going to um, involve parents in this and so forth. So, this will be new information probably to most everybody that doesn't have a, a pre-K through second grade child. Now this test is also being used for assessment for special ed students in higher grade because it does give them specific information and those teachers are expected to grow children as well. All right, I think that's the last one. Any questions? What kind of feedback are you getting from your teachers? Well, you know, we have some teachers who are 
in the, the TAP program. Mm -hmm. and their custom in the TAP is they get extra bonuses based on student growth. They're, they're accustomed to the MAC RIT score. And so they're asking how is this going to show growth. And just today I talked with the uh, gentleman in charge of TAP. He said that this part, that this um, assessment would work fine and these skills would work fine. Basically what he said, what I told you, that there's a 20 point expected growth and they make a 31 in the fall, they're expected to make a 51 just to maintain in the winter. So then they'll be expected to, sh if they want to show above expected growth, then they're going to have to go beyond the 51 uh, for the expected growth. So as far as the teachers liking the test for the students, you get very positive feedback there. And we've got the two schools, Bells and Hendersonville, that those teachers are concerned about how is it going to be used in the TAP program, but I've been assured by the State Department that it's going to work fine. Looking at page 12, you know, the, I guess we'll use some, we'll give the, I'm assuming this is a ranking on how the classes with a particular teacher ultimately did, you know, um, assuming relatively speaking common, if you will, potential with students. Um, if you see where teachers are excelling significantly, or on the flip side, you see where teachers may be struggling, what do we pull from the classroom with respect to success stories and figure out how to roll those back into the ones that might be struggling? You know? uh, in, in the leadership teams, and, the, and some of them, let's say like Forest Hills, for example, whenever we go in from the district level, we're actually meeting with the, the teachers. They're part of that team. We come in, we talk with them. So the teachers understand that this is not just the principal looking at this data. This is the district looking at this data. And then the teachers, the principals already have the teachers uh, doing data notebooks and things of that nature. So I think every teacher in the district is cognizant of the fact that we expect students to grow. What I think this does is makes it the teacher more in control of what she can do to help those students grow. It's not just, here's a test with results, now you go out and do something to make them grow. This tells them specifically, this child, here's how this child did on this assessment, here's what we had to do to get the child to, to get this correct, and we had to give them a hint, or we didn't have to give them a hint. It tells them the end of the year expectation, so now that teacher and start teaching to that end of the year expectation. But now the fall testing, one other thing I may need to point out, the, the question bank for the fall testing is different from the question bank for the winter question. So those questions got more difficult. As the children progress through the year, there's a higher expectation. And as they go to the spring, there's still another higher expectation. So that, um, where they showed the graph of where here's the fall window that goes from 0 to 60, and the winter window goes 20 to 80, and the spring window goes from 40 to 100. That's showing the expected uh, growth of the increase in the level of difficulty. Mr. Barnes, if you don't mind. Mr. Thank you. Mr. Barnes, go ahead. Um, I love this assessment, and I'm going to tell you why. The reason why I love it is I'm, I'm familiar with this assessment. The reason why I love it is because it gives accurate feedback to not only individual students, but standards. Um, the question that I have that I'm not, too, I'm not understanding too good is how often, if we do or not, send on results of assessments to parents? Well, when I talk with, with uh the principals and so forth. Well, will we say more? Because well, I don't think we're doing this yet. We no, don't this no yet. we've just completed the first test. So we're, it's so new to our teachers and principals that we're trying to basically determine that very thing. But what we've talked about, if there's some way we can link, electronically link this result to something like Notify Me, 
then that parent can go in and get their result and there won't be all this paper going home and some of it ends up in the bottom of the book bag that's never looked at. But we know since it has the potential for to inform parents, and we need parents to be a part of um, the team and so forth, we know we've got to give the parents that information. And this is a Title I initiative, so um, it may become part of the Title I communication. Now, um, parents obtaining that information, I, I'm not sure. Mm, Correct me on map testing. Currently, we do map testing twice a year. Uh, we do it as a district mandated twice a year. Twice a year. Um, teachers now currently get the results of those map testing or those map tests a few months after they are given. No, they can get it within 24 hours. But what most of the school schools do is they have the, the uh, test proctor to write the score down as soon as the child finishes. So they get a picture of their class, but they don't necessarily get is how to help that class. Right, because this, this assessment will, in other words, if, if my child is struggling in two-digit numbers, and I'm not saying that that's a specific standard, but this assessment will immediately identify that struggle. And as a parent, it would be good for me to know that information because I should expect more homework coming home with my child on adding two digit numbers. And and the teacher also should should know that and give yeah, and give more more classroom instruction pertaining to adding two digit numbers. Yeah, if that teacher wants that student to grow. And if the end of the end of the year objective is for this to happen, that teacher's gonna have to make sure that that child is, is growing. So the thing, the good thing about this, she can retest the child whenever she chooses to. Now you can do the same thing in math, but it, it's uh, it's not going to give you specific information like this is giving. Mm -hmm. Last question. Last question, Mr. Chair. Um, since this assessment gives us invaluable, in my opinion, invaluable data related to academic achievement and academic progress. Um, we don't, we as a board don't have to approve, we don't have to approve using this assessment. No, I, it's a um, part of our curriculum. We've posted part of the curriculum. Title I has to use some assessment because whenever they, the schools write their projects, there's a column that says, how are you going to measure this activity? Now, are we, are we as a district, is it, since this is in the, kind of like in the preliminary stages of us using it, are we as a district having, are you all having talks about how we're going to, to collect this data as a result to, as a result, I mean, as it relates to student achievement, related to teachers' instruction? When we meet with the principals, Basically, at this point, it's the primary principals and Ms. Williams, Jessica Williams, when she has the, prime, the elementary principals coming in, we talk about this in general. How is it doing? Because we're still in, where are we really going to go with this assessment? Um, but my answer would be yes, we're very aware that we've got to put together a protocol on what are the expectations for the teachers, as far as informing parents, what are the expectations of teachers as far as when we go in and observe, seeing right. the, the teacher teach towards this activity. And you know, you read any of our plans that talks about differentiated instruction. Mm -hmm. This is exactly what this is doing, it's differentiating instruction and it's telling the teachers, here are the child, children who should be in this particular group. And here's a, how they did on this activity, uh, this common core question. Mr. Thank you. The demographics within a, in a classroom, <clears throat> I've heard teachers say, well, this year I've got a great class, and they soar. The next year they have a class that doesn't soar. Um, how are you going to interpret the test scores 
based on the demographics and assess that teacher as to whether they're doing a good job or whether they're doing a bad job? Excellent question. I just asked that today. And they put a graph on the, on the screen. And I, I'll try, I wrote the location down for this graphic for the state school board. And they said uh, Bill Hayden was there. Right. The other, you see the other shaking their head. And I asked that question because I said, you know, who we could be compared to? And they said, when it comes to growth, is that no matter what your demographic is, if you scored, let's say on this test, you scored a beginning score of 27, then everybody else who scored 27 is, has that in common with you. And then they put up a graph that showed that there was no difference in, in the growth expectation. Then they put up another graph showing achievement expectation. And that's where they said the question that you just asked would be more relevant in that achievement, in other words, whatever their top score is on that test, is affected by demographics, whether or not there's poverty um, and things of that nature. So what we're being told by the State Department as we're going through the training for our new teacher evaluation instrument, which is based on growth, they're saying using the growth model is much more fair to the teacher than using the achievement model. And right now, the state is using the achievement model. So that means you can have a student who has scored above uh, let's, let's say uh, at E5 level on the past test, their score goes down, but they're still at the E5 level. What the growth model is looking for, this child made a 100, or let's use this example here, this child made a 21 on the first test, and this child over here made a 51, we're expecting both of those children to grow, whether or not they're at the expected level or below the expectation level. So that, that's how I would interpret what I was told today. And I asked that point blank and pushed it pretty hard. Is it, and they said, oh no, there's no statistical data to support that in the growth model uh, that demographics has that big a role to play. It will. But isn't that how TAP do it? No. Yeah, TAP. As far as the TAP is a growth. But TAP is based on this information um, that we, I just told you about today, that I went to today. It was basically a TAP. The guy who was in charge was the TAP uh, coordinator for the state. But yes, I think that you know demographics, maybe culture may have something to play with it. Uh, but, but we'll see. Any other thoughts or questions for Mr. Pence? Mr. Pence, I will make one closing comment. Uh, I'll speak for myself. I do like the uh, the model in TAP that uh, awards high achievers. Um, it's very common to see that elsewhere in the private sector, the public sector. You know, um, and I think it's good to have incentives out there for folks to, to take it up a notch, so to speak, in their performance, and uh, and also that to serve as an encouragement for others. So. Uh, that's something that Senator Matthews spoke, at, spoke about at our meeting at Hilton Head. It's something that the state legislative body is considering. So, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Turner and Ms. Pence. Um, to the Facilities Committee, do not forget we will be meeting Thursday at the district office at 1130. We look forward to seeing you there. As I shared with you previously, we have been, we've contracted with the State School Board Association to upgrade and update our current policy manual. At this point, we have received the first few sections that have been returned to us. So what I need at this time are two to three members from the board who can serve on a policy committee to help review what has been sent to us to make sure that we're still in line with the, the previous policies as well as the updates that have been recommended by the school board association it will take some time to read through the policies and be able to offer 
that feedback um, back and forth between my office as well as the school board association. So um, three persons, if you would think about that, at least by our January meeting, be able to um, provide me with two to three names of persons that were willing to support with that effort. Ms. Williams, what I'll just think out loud what I'd like the board to consider um, not to, if you will, overload. We'll take uh, maybe three that are not currently on the um, facilities committee and I will ask for those others to consider possibly supporting this request. So, thank you, ma'am. I, yep. um, I asked a while back to, uh, a list of uh, committees that each board member is on. I don't know if that was given out of the meeting I, I missed, but um, we'll be talking about that. Cause good point. We'll, uh, we'll revisit that, that and then I'll meet with Ms. Williams and we'll make sure we give proper priority to those areas that we need to address. Mr. Bowman, I think you were going to ask. Yes, so we already have a um, We do. We do. And, but I want to give consideration not to. Well, you want to change the members of the Just not to, not to spread any one person too much. Because this so one's going to be pretty intense. Yep. Okay. Um, date to remember the State School Board Association Annual Convention, February 20th to 23rd. Um, I know Ms. Strobel's working on, on that now. So just to make sure you have that on your calendar. And that concludes my report for this month. Any questions for Ms. Williams? Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, finance, Mr. Cornell, please. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to make a motion that we accept the finance report, the budget report. Second. We've got a motion and a second to, to accept the reports as submitted. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by raising your hand. Chris, it's unanimous. I'll also make a motion that uh, Billy and should we go ahead and accept this? Yes. As information um, on the fiscal report, uh, June 30th, 2013. Second. We've got a motion and a second to accept the uh, report uh, dealing with the financial status of the, of the district uh, dated again, PA? June 30th, 2013. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor signify by raising your hand. Chris, as unanimous. Replacement report. Thank you, Mr. Fornell. Uh, Mr. Hayes, technology, please, sir. We had a report last week. Uh, best time here tonight. Uh, Ms. Williams, you got anything to add for technology, or are we good? Uh, we have nothing to Mr. Mr. Hayes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Shadow, instruction, please, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, this uh, we're going to call Mr. Pins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shadow, ladies and gentlemen of the board. Uh, I don't have anything to add to the transportation update. But I would like to ask you to consider the two field trips that the occupation presented last week. I'm, I'm, I'm going back in time. I can go further back if I need. Alright, uh, Brenda Williams at the Thunderbolt Career Technology Center is requesting uh, permission to take students to Atlanta for a college tour on Friday, uh, January 24th, and Saturday, the 25th, 2014. Notice she has going to take up to 50 students, and she has up to five chaperones that are going to get to that. And she has supportive information about the uh, itinerary and so all behind that request. Okay, Mr. Chairman, I, I move that we accept the recommendation and grant approval to Thunderbolt Career Technology Center to go to Atlanta on um, January 24, 2014 through January the 25th, 2014. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the request for a out-of-state uh, field trip to Atlanta by uh, members of our uh, Thunderbolt community. Any discussion? Um, yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bowman? Mr. Pence, I, I don't know how, how much you know uh, how much how much you know about this trip, but the only it has pickup location Orangeburg, South Carolina, and Walterboro. Does that mean our students will be going with other students from Orangeburg? Can I defer to Mr. Hayden? Not that I'm aware of. I can check on that for you, but I'm not aware of, of any um and Miss Williams comes from Orangeburg um, herself, but I'm not aware of any students from Orangeburg okay. on the trip. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Chairman. Yes, sir. Any other discussion? All those in favor, uh, signify by raising hand. It's unanimous, Chris. All right, we also have a request from Stephanie Gall of Alton County High School to be able to take 40 members of the chorus to New York, New York. And they're going to be working on Broadway workshops and tours. This request is for Wednesday, March 26th through Sunday, March the 30th, 2014. I'm going to ask that you uh, consider this request at this time. Mr. Chairman, once again, I move that we grant the Common County High School course the opportunity to go to New York on the uh, March the 26th, 2014 through March the 30th, 2014. Second. Got a motion and a second for an out-of-state field trip uh, to New York on the course uh, March 26th through 30th, 2014. Um, any discussion? All those in favor, signify by raising your hand. Chris, it's unanimous. Thank you very much. Mr. Pitts, while you stand, does that conclude Dr. Dixon's report also? I think you have anything to add. Information last week, so there's nothing to do with it. Okay. Thank you. And did we see Ms. Williams in here earlier? She was. She had the lead. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Next, Ms. Bryant. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I do not have any additions to my report submitted on last week. If you have questions, I'll be glad to answer it in reference to my report. Okay, do we have any questions for Ms. Brown? Seeing that. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Shadow. Um, Ms. Jones, Bill Nate Brown. Mr. Chief. Yes, ma'am. Um, Mr. Williams back from the State Department related to the 
It's pending investigation, nothing yet. Yeah. Okay, still, thank you. Still working. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, Mr. Mark. Yes, have we heard anything from the student that got hit by a car? We have no unfinished business to attend to or any new business. At this time, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. We've got a motion. All those in favor, stand up. Let's go home. <laughs>